Hello, everybody. Welcome to our afternoon session with two plenary speakers. Our first plenary is Professor Serge Prudhomme from Montreal, and uh, it will be shared by Professor Philip Devlu from Unicampi. Please, Philip. Good afternoon. Well, it's an enormous pleasure to, to introduce to you guys uh, to Serge Prudhomme. Uh, I've known Serge. Uh, when he was working at ISIS at the University of Texas. Uh, he's actually, he got his first degree quite close to Belgium, as I'm Belgian. He, he graduated from uh, Ecole Centrale de Lille. He did his master's in the University of Virginia and did his PhD at UT Austin a little bit. He arrived a little bit after I left. Uh, his research interests are very typical for ISIS, uh, computational engineering and science, finite element methods, a posteriori error estimates and adaptive methods. So that's we definitely have in common. Multiscale modeling, uh, methods of verification and validation of predictive modeling, that's extremely important. Uncertainty quantification and reduced order modeling. So it's my enormous pleasure to introduce to Guy you to present you uh, Serge Prino. Serge. Thank you very much, uh, Philip, for this uh, kind introduction. Uh, I'm uh, very pleased. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank also the organizers to to be uh, with you today. Um, I've never. I would like, of course, I would have liked to be uh, with you in Brazil, especially that I've never been there. Actually, I'm lying a little bit because I had the opportunity to have dinner in Brazil. I just crossed the the boundary, the the border from from Montreal from Montreal, <laughs> from uh, uh, Colombia, and I was able to enjoy a nice nice dinner in in Brazil. Uh, I'm also showing in the background the weather from uh, this morning in Montreal. So as you can see, uh, global warming is in some way working. It's a beautiful uh, day today. Uh, so I'm going to talk about error estimation. Uh, usually I like, uh, that's my field of interest. Uh, I try to look at other things, but eventually uh, I will always come back to error estimation and adaptivity. Uh, I guess this is my true love. So why should we be interested in uh, error estimation? So no surprise, I would say that this is the core of our uh, job, basically, in computational science uh, and engineering. Uh, we know that as soon as we do some simulations, we are going to make some errors to the point that when I teach my class on uh, computing, uh, uh, scientific computing for the engineers at Polytechnique Montreal, I the first talk about errors. I talk about modeling errors, I talk about truncation errors uh, and error propagation, as I show here the content of the first chapter of this book by, uh, by André Fortin. So of course, the first question I get from the student is, how can we get the error if we do not know the exact solution? A short answer would be to do like Banksy. We just sweep it under the curtain or the rug, and we try to forget about it. This is, I think, not the good answer. And I'm going to, sh and very quickly in the class, what we see is this uh, very important uh, inequalities 
trying to bound the relative error when we consider a system of algebraic equations. What we see here is that our relative error in an approximation X star of uh, this problem essentially is bounded by the residual on one side and the other. And of course, we introduce this condition number. I think, I think you all have seen this, uh, but this is a very important result showing to the student that actually we don't compute the error, but we try to measure with the error and try to find some bounds to uh, get a good indication of, of, uh, of this error. So I will come back to this later on. Uh, we should so we should also get interested in error estimation because, as uh, Karl Proper says, I mean this is an important part of the scientific process. Uh, what I'm showing here is essentially uh, first we have a problem situation. We want to propose some theories, and then we are going to test those theories, trying to find and estimate the error, and our goal would be to eliminate that error. Of course, this is an iterative process. This is a little bit different from what I'm going to present here because in this uh, process of science, it refers essentially to validation, trying to find the error due to the model with respect to uh, observables. Uh, what I'm going to talk more essentially is about the error. Uh, it's about verification when we try to estimate the error in our discrete solutions. So this is the outline of, the, of, the, of my presentation. I'm going to talk first, I'm going to review uh, some things that you may already know. Basically the classical error estimates with respect to norms. I will show you how we can adapt from those estimates. I will uh, review also uh, a, a more recent topic, which is on goal-oriented error estimation, when we try to estimate the errors with respect to some quantities of interest. I will briefly show you some extension, because in the first part, I will show the results essentially with respect to the finite element method, but we can do that for all the types of, of, of problems. Later on, I will try to convince you that maybe uh, we should try to compute uh, a solution that will be good automatically for the quantity of interest. And this is what I call a goriented formulation for FEM. And I will extend the results to reduce order modeling. And I will uh, finish uh, my, my, my talk by giving you some perspectives in mesh optimization and maybe machine learning if time permits. So, Again, as I said uh, maybe earlier, error estimation is useful first to provide a measure of the accuracy in approximations. To control the errors in those approximations using adaptation and hopefully to be able to accelerate our calculations. And this is becoming very important when we talk about UQ, machine learning and et cetera. Uh, I'm going to use the, uh, the words of uh, Pedro Diaz, which I think uh, put it in the best way, the, the, the idea here is to guarantee the quality of the solution for error estimation and certification, and to provide useful tools to improve the results, error assessment, error indicators, remeshing criteria for solution verification. And of course, it has to be affordable and accurate. Briefly, we know that there are two types, two families of error estimation uh, estimate. So today we since the mid 70s, people have been working on estimating uh, the error with respect to some global norms. And we have different uh, methods such as the residual estimators, error in constitutive relation, the ZZ recovery estimators. However, what I'm showing here is essentially an adaptive mesh based on those uh, global estimates. And the problem, for example, here, this, I mean, it's, it does a good job. This is a flow around an obstacle using the Stokes equations. And this approach basically refine the singularities at those corners. Supposing that we are interested in a solution in that little uh, corner, we will never be able to reach an accurate solution because what it's going to see first of all are those singularities. And this is where the goal-oriented error estimation come up. 
where we propose to get a quantity of interest. For example, I considered here a quantity based on the vorticity in this region, and then we can adapt the mesh accordingly. I will present that later uh, in detail. So I'm going to consider an abstract problem in the weak form where we look for the solution U. And I have the corresponding uh, finite element problem where we are looking for the UH using the Galarkin approach. And of course, the error U minus UH will satisfy this problem where the residual R defined as such basically becomes the source of errors for E. And we're going to suppose that uh, the, this problem satisfies the lax milligram theorem. Basically that B is continuous and coercive, F is continuous with respect to a given norm in that Hilbert space V. And I'm going to introduce the norm of the residual. So this is a soup norm. And what I will what I want to show later on is that we don't estimate the error when we do error estimation. What we do is to estimate the norm of the residual. How we do that? Well, we can just use the lax milgram uh, theorem, introducing the coercivity constant alpha and the continuity constant m. And we see that we have this relation for the error. The error is go going to be bounded by this norm above and below by this norm of the residual. I can do that also for you. And combining those two equations, what, I uh, what I'm finding now is exactly an estimate for the error, uh, the relative error, just at the one I presented before for the system of algebraic equations. And essentially, M on the alpha is in some sense corresponding to this condition, uh, condition number of the matrix. So the difficulty now is to estimate this norm of the residual. There are several ways. Uh, one way is to use explicit methods uh, that are going to uh, use as well some a priori er uh, error estimates. This is where I introduce a constant of interpolation, but I can show that my norm of the residual is going to be smaller than some contributions uh, in terms of the interior residual in each element and some jumps that have been used uh, many times. Uh, better than those explicit methods, we can also introduce some implicit methods where we are going to uh, solve so for some auxiliary problem. And then uh, we have to use the Ritz representation theorem Basically, we introduce A, a linear product associated with our norm. And we can show that if we solve for the reads we present uh, for essentially this problem for phi, we obtain, if we solve this problem, we obtain a phi for which the norm is equal to the norm of the residual. And all the problems that we are going to consider, essentially, all the methods that have been developed are based on trying to find some approximation of this problem. Basically, in trying to find an approximation of uh, this um, reads representer. Uh, the way people do it, so there are different types of methods. The idea is here to decompose A into a collection of local problems. And the, in, the interesting thing is, is like basically we can decompose the error estimate into local contributions to uh, obtain the, some refining, uh, refinement indicators as such. And we can use different adaptive strategies, for example, based on the maximum approach or the Durfler approach. Uh, I'm showing here the one based on the maximum approach. Uh, we normalize all uh, element-wise contribution with respect to the max of the contributions. We get a number here, a uh, refinement indicator between 0 and 1. And for all the contributions that are bigger than 0 0.5, we are going to refine the element. This is essentially a greedy approach. Uh, one question that has, has been asking myself is, is the choice of the norm important? Well, I'm going to take a very simple problem, the 1D convection diffusion uh, problem, just in 1D for illustration. 
And for this problem, uh, epsilon is our viscosity, and we know that we are going to obtain a, 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 a boundary layer at one, very steep, depending, and this the, the width of the boundary layer depends on epsilon. Actually, it is in the order of epsilon. One remark first is that we can transform this problem into a Poisson problem using an integrating factor, the one that I'm giving here. And we have actually this problem is essentially equivalent to this one. So if I solve this problem, I could consider the H1 norm given here, the energy norm given here. For these two norms, I get an M over alpha that is depending, uh, which is of the order of one over epsilon. And epsilon can be very small. So we see that essentially the condition number, if I can say so, becomes very large. However, we can also introduce a new norm based on this integration factor, which is given here. I was not able to compute those two constant m and alpha, but I'm just going to show you the results that we obtain. Uh, of course, there were there have been a lot of um, okay. This is what I this is the result that I'm showing and. The most important thing here, I'm showing the error with respect to the number of uh, degrees of freedom. What I see here is that this Brezis norm gives me an error that is decreasing much faster than for the other types of errors. This is important. And the I question is... Do Serge, I have some problem with the slide. Can you go back and forth with your slide? I am in slide 12. Yeah, that's OK. I know it's OK for me. It was a wrong uh, okay. projection. Okay. All right. Uh, it took some time to show up. So here, basically, I have uh, what I'm showing, essentially, is that the error decreases much faster if I do use this uh, Brazil's norm. Question now, do we get an optimal mesh? And this is a question that people have been trying to uh, uh, address in the last uh, 20 years. But uh, which method would give me, would be optimal? Uh, what people have been able to show essentially is that this optimality uh, will depend on the rate of convergence. They try to find some approaches, methods that uh, give us an optimal rate of convergence. However, when we do adaptation, it's not necessarily the, 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 the rate of convergence that we are interested in. It's more the fact that we can move this asymptotic regime as far left as possible, especially in 3D. We want to have some method that could get to the uh, asymptotic regime as fast as possible. So I try. I tried a little bit to think about that, and uh, what I try to actually derive some transformation, some mapping, to be able to generate from a uniform mesh an adapted mesh, and I wanted to use the information from my um, equations. So we saw that we could transform using the inter integrating factor um, a new problem, a Poisson problem. Actually, when we use these convection diffusion equations, we can also reduce this equation to a Laplace equation, just given here, using this complex mapping. So my view was to try to maybe play with those two mappings to construct a mapping that could give me a better uh, mesh than the one I would obtain with uh, adaptivity based on error estimate. And actually, I show here the H1 norm. I do see a better convergence here in magenta as compared to the one shown in black, where it's the adaptivity. And I see that using this mapping, uh, based on the combination of the, of the two mapping, I do get to the asymptotic regime much faster. So the question here, I'm showing the transformation. This transformation it corresponds to the adapted mesh. This one magenta is the one that I obtain using those two transformations. 
my question is, where is the optimal transformation? I believe, looking at those two curves, I believe it's in between. How can I get to it? Okay, now I'm going to go to uh, goal-oriented error estimation. And the goal here is not to uh, measure the error in, with, with respect to the norm, but with respect to the, the quantity of interest. That is a linear functional of u. And now the goal is to estimate the error in that quantity of interest. And in order to do that, we uh, introduce what we call the generalized green function. Uh, this function p basically is such that q of u should be equal to f of p. And if I use my primal problem, I can derive this adjoint problem. And this adjoint problem is what's going to help me get some error estimates in the quantity of interest. And I have first to get a new representation of my error. So first of all, with the linearity of Q, of course, we can uh, extend this to nonlinear problem. I obtain this. Uh, which is to, uh, simply Q of E. I can use now the adjoint problem to get this, inequal uh, this equality. And now from the error equations, I can relate this error with the residual. So in some ways, I show again that the error now is the product of the residual with this adjoint solution. And over, uh, of course, if we use the proper th uh, orthogonality property given here, we can also get as an, a representation for this error in the quantity of interest, this relation. So now the main difficulty is of course to uh, get a good approximation of this adjunct solution because it's not available for most of the problems. Uh, those works started in the in the nineties. Uh, essentially, uh, that was um, started with uh, Ericsson and Becker. And those essentially the difference between those uh, different uh, uh, approaches is the way that uh, people uh, approximate this adjoint problem and do the post processing to get some estimate of the errors. Uh, zero, because I think there was also a landmark paper uh, by Gartland in 1984, so about 10 years before, who I think understood what was going on to try to get uh, errors in quantities of interest. And then in this case, he was interested in pointwise uh, solution using the green function. So. Now, what I'm going to show here now is the way we do approximate the adjoint in a simple way, what we can do, and this is due, so, uh, the, due to the orthogonality property, we have to approximate the adjoint solution by P tilde, which is going to be in a richer space than our element space that we use for the finite element solution. Based on this result, we can actually have uh, we can estimate then P minus P tilde. And the uh, error estimate that I'm going to get is going to be given in terms of P tilde H. Uh, it should be here P tilde H. Uh, and then we can also obtain some bonds. And the advantage of this representation here is now that we can decompose this quantity into element-wise quantities. And this is what I'm showing here. We have our error. Our, uh, we have an estimate eta. That can be decomposed in element-wise um, quantities. The thing is, this uh, decomposition is not unique. There are many ways to do it. And I'm not going to go over this. I will just show some results that show that we do get different results depending on the way that we decompose those uh, this, uh, this estimate. Uh, so here I'm just uh, showing a way to refine again using the maximum uh, strategy. Here that was a solution obtained using the uh, 
uh, with respect to the error in the energy norm. We had a bump in that region and we do capture that bump. If I am interested in the solution at a point using the goal quantity, we do get a mesh that is now adapted for the calculation of this quantity of interest. Of course, again, the question is, is this mesh optimal? And here, just as an illustration, I was again playing with this uh, boundary layer problem with a very small epsilon. And what we do see in that case is that depending on the way, uh, so all these are possibilities means to decompose my estimate. And we see that actually, depending on this decomposition, we obtain very different solution. Again, I'm uh, showing the relative error in the quantity of interest with respect to the number of degrees of freedom. Uh, also, I think it went too fast. That was in the case, for example, that epsilon was 0 0.01. So clearly we show some method that do better, for example, the, the red one and the black one. Now, if I go to 0 0.0001, which is a little bit difficult, more difficult, we see that other methods give some better results. So which one is going to be the best one? That's always my big uh, issue and my big question. So we have been able to extend this to all the type of problems. Uh, essentially, we also for multi-scale and couple problems. Here we have a multi-scale problem in which we look at uh, a crack at the tip. And we were interested here in the gap, in the gap region. So what we were able to adapt, so multi-scale in the sense we would use a continue, uh, continue, uh, continuum model with a particle model around the, the tip of the crack. So we started with a simulation where the, oops, where the tip of the crack, uh, we had only the um, particle model at the tip of the crack and using this adapted procedure, we were able to extend this region in such a way that we would minimize the error in the gap. We did also uh, a similar, uh, some work for problems with uncertain coefficients. Uh, here, I'm just showing the results. Oops. Uh, so that was a, a problem uh, where we considered the flow around the cylinder using the Navier-Stokes equations at low Reynolds number. And uh, we, yes? Uh, again, you're, there's something wrong with slide. Can you go back and forth? Yeah, it's showing for me, but not for you. Okay, here, there's a... Now, yes, it takes a little bit, uh, it like, okay, it takes some time. So here, basically, it's a problem with uncertain coefficients, Navier-Stokes. And the uncertainty were uh, chosen for two parameters, for the viscosity and for the inflow velocity. So we have uh, C1 and C2. We chose them uniform and in such a way that the Reynolds number were contained between 1 and 37 to ensure that we had a laminar flow. So now the thing is like if we, so we have two discretization, one for the physics and one for the parameters, we show here by using an adaptive goal-oriented approach that we do much better than the other if, uh, first of all, first of all, it, what is important here is to really well distinguish the two types of errors and do adaptivity with respect to those two types of errors, one in the parameters and one in the discretization of the equations. So the solution in red is the one, and it's much better than just adapting with respect to the parameters or adapting with respect just to the discretization of the physics or using a uniform discretization. The quantity of interest in that point was the, uh, the derivative of the velocity in uh, just at a point in the wake of the, of the, of the cylinder. All right. 
All right. So as I said earlier, the question is what we've been doing so far when we talk about classical goal-oriented error control is that we first solve the primal problem with respect to the energy norm. Once we solve this primal problem, we do some error estimation with respect to the quantity of interest. Essentially, we are going to compute this dual problem, this adjoint problem, and we are going to get an estimate in order to adapt our range. And we do hope that uh, we get a, a space that is optimized with respect to the quantity of interest. I have suggested that, uh, a few years ago that why not try to get a solution that is going to be good directly for the quantity of interest. And in that case, uh, we would consider the dual problem and then define, based on this, the solution of the dual uh, problem, define a constrained primal problem that is going to give us a better solution WH, that I will call WH, for the quantity of interest. And of course, we can uh, uh, do some adaptation, error estimation and adaptation, and this is again an iterative process. So, briefly, the idea is the following. I can start by looking at uh, the energy functional that I want to minimize and for which I'm going to put a constraint. I want that the solution satisfy the quantity of interest. Of course, we don't have this value. Uh, we can extend this to actually several quantities of interest. And this constraint minimization problem is transformed into a Lagrange formulation as such, where I see that I impose the constraint for the quantity of interest. For the, actually, for this alpha e that I don't know, I can get a good approximation of my quantity of interest using the adjunct solution. Solve on a finer mesh as before than the mesh that I use for my finite element solution. And then I will just reply, replace those alpha i by this. So then I'm going to get a mixed problem. Basically, I'm looking for now for the WH and the Lagrange multiplier lambda that is going to satisfy this. The difference that now that uh, between the WH that I'm going to get is that it's going to satisfy a better quantity of interest than the UH that I would solve directly based on the energy now. And we do have a relation between actually UH and WH in terms of those Lagrange multipliers. Those Lagrange multipliers, what they do basically is to indicate how much WH moves away from the global min minimizer UH and basically what the sacrifice on energy is to satisfy the constraints. Uh, we can show actually that this WH, this new WH, is near optimal in energy now. Basically, we have a constant that relates this error and the error in UH. Okay, And we can use this relation to derive some error estimate in WH. And basically, we have U minus WH, which is going to be in part a discretization error, U minus UH and an error due to that constraint, UH minus, minus WH, which is simply given here. And we can do the same also for goal-oriented error estimation. I'm going to show you a few results here. Uh, this is the case of a double L-shaped problem. So we have a coefficient A that is uh, piecewise continuous, so very high here in that region in gray and in, in, in there. So of course, we are going to have a discontinuity at this point and at this point. I'm going to consider two quantities of interest. The first one is going to be defined as the uh, average of u in that small omega one. 
And the second one is the uh, average of the first derivative in X in that uh, omega 2. So I'm showing here the adjoint solution and the primal solution for those two. Uh, and the primal solution for this problem. So what we see here is we if, if UH here is the solution, the classical solution that I get. When I adapt with the, respect to the energy norm, we see that we are going to adapt at the corners, of course, because we have some singularities here. And we do essentially the same for WH. We see that with respect to the energy norm, we are also going to refine at the uh, singularities. When I do the adaptation with respect to the quantity of interest, we don't see a big difference. For UH, we also see the first singularity in that region and a little bit that singularity. In the same way, when we consider WH, the mesh is a little bit more refined, uh, more refined also here and also here. There are some slight differences. What is important is when we look actually at the rate of convergence. Uh, and I'm going to show you only this case here, the quantity of interest uh, the error with respect to the first quantity of interest. When we look at WH, we see that we have a better rate of convergence. WH provide us a solution that is um, more accurate with respect to my quantity of interest. Of course, this is not a surprise since basically WH is constrained to satisfy a good quantity of interest. All right, so that, that's the goal. Uh, for the sake of time, I will go a little bit quickly here. We were able also to do that, uh, to we extend the methodology for uh, reduce order models. And of course, you know that for reduce order models, we can decompose the solution, we can expand our solution and truncate that expansion and the idea is now to find the basis functions, the best basis functions for our problem. So we have PUD, uh, Kevin Karlsberg talked about it before. We have some reduced basics methods and we have the PGD, the proper generalized decomposition method. So here the idea is to compute on the fly the two basis functions to find basically the best basis function, but on the fly. Uh, the idea is again to minimize the energy of the problem. And we want to find a separated representation. So essentially it's mimicking the method of separation of variables where we are going to look for u as this expansion. And what we want to do is knowing the first few modes, we want to find the new mode. And for that, we can consider a optimization problem given here. Basically, knowing um minus one, we want to find psi phi for the next uh, iteration. I'm going to pass uh, the way we solve this problem. It takes time. Basically, in doing so, we are going again to have a mixed problem. First, a problem where we are going to look for psi, and then a problem where we are going to uh, look for phi. And we do iterate. And now we have our constraint on the quantity of interest. Uh, I can show you just uh, the results uh, for electric uh, impedance tomography where we have a problem in which we have electrodes on top of on the two surfaces, top surface and bottom surface. We have two space variable X and Y. Uh, we are going to solve this essentially Poisson problem. And we're going to consider that we don't know sigma A and sigma B. Those are going to be uncertain. And we don't know exactly the position of the first electrode gamma one. And we are going to consider, so the load corresponds to the difference of potential between gamma one and uh, gamma five, I think. 
and we are going to consider three quantities of interest, basically the potentials between the other pairs of electrodes. And here the difficulty is that we have to optimize with respect to the number of modes that we need, that we want to have a good solution, and we need also to uh, get a good solution with respect to the discretization of the problems that I've shown you before. Uh, so this is the mesh that I obtain here for my electrodes, uh, for, my, uh, in, uh, for X and Y. And here, the mesh that I'm going to obtain for the, uh, for the parameters sigma A and sigma B, we see that we don't need to actually adapt that space. On the other hand, the position of the electrode has to be refined. And we observe a better rate of convergence. All right. Since we are looking at optimization now, and we want to actually optimize the mesh, and that's my big question. Why not try to develop a problem for which we do optimize the mesh directly? And I went back to the literature and I saw that actually a first paper on that topic was in 1973. Very, it was actually what they do, that was a plate problem and starting from a uniform mesh, uh, minimizing the energy of the problem, they were able to adapt and optimize the position of the nodes. There was another paper also here where they, it's more or less the same, except that now they, the, the idea, the goal was to optimize with respect to the, uh, to the error. And there is an optimization problem that is solved and that provides that type of mesh. Uh, we did the same also when we considered some uh, lattice problem. Basically, we want to replace a solid model by a lattice. And our view is that we should have an adapted lattice in order to optimize the configure the structure of this lattice. And we were able to obtain such a solution. Uh, even better uh, prob um, model um, method was the one uh, proposed by uh, Matt Zarr very recently, where it tries to optimize the position. I mean, basically, it tries to align the mesh along a discontinuity in a supersonic flow. And that gives a very nice result and very efficient results. So this is the optimization problem. Basically, what we would like to optimize now is the position of the nodes that minimize the error. Of course, the error is not known. So we can do an approximation on a fine mesh. U is not C1. So that complexifies a little bit the optimization uh, problem. Uh, another issue is that the number of parameters are going to increase in this uh, optimization problem when the size of the mesh increases. Actually, the idea is not to necessarily optimize the position of the node, but rather to find a good transformation, a good mapping. Uh, and of course, the relation UH in terms of the position of the node is not trivial. So then we can consider a constraint problem. More interesting. Uh, Serge, if I can ask you to go a little bit Wrap faster, up. we're not going to have time for questions. Okay, I'm just going to finish with those two uh, slides and I will, uh, uh, I will conclude because I think this is very important here. We can actually, and uh, this, uh, this is a work that I looked uh, very uh, recently, it's on optimal transport. Actually, we can try to use the ideas of optimal transport to adapt our mesh. Optimal sampling here, the idea would be, so we would use a Voronoi diagram rather than the mesh itself. And we would like, starting with a discrete, with uh, an, uh, some sampling points, Y, uh, I, trying to minimize this, basically to minimize, make sure that the point actually are going to become the central, uh, the center of mass of the uh, Voronoi cell. So that would be a problem. 
that we need to minimize with respect to some measure. So here, starting with a, starting with a, a, a I would say a, um, a set of points, random, if I use a measure that is going to be uniform, I would obtain, after some iteration, I would obtain a uniform mesh. The idea is that for the measure, we could use essentially a representation of the error, an estimate, the distribution of my error. So here I'm going to show a mesh for which we had a uniform measure and we are going to converge to essentially a uniform mesh. Now here I'm going to suppose that I have errors that are very large in this region and in this region, and we are going to see that actually the mesh is going to be adapted with respect to those two things, to those positions where we have larger errors. And it seems to be that it's a very easy uh, problem to uh, easier problem to solve, and we can use all the tools that have been developed in optimal transport. Okay, I'm going to pass the few words I wanted to say about machine learning. I was trying to find an optimal mesh in the literature, and in my view, this is the most beautiful mesh. If of course uh, the objective function was beauty. <laughs> and I'm going to conclude here. And I can let you uh, read the conclusion. Thank you very much uh, for your attention and sorry for taking a little bit more time. Thank you, Serge, for this very nice talk of, you know, the whole career dedicated to air optimizing meshes and error estimates. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, I have no question at this point. Uh, on, uh, are you sure, Alvaro, the, the session is open for questions from, from the audience? Uh, while there's no question, I'm going to formulate one of my own. Uh, I have had... Uh, Quite have used error estimates based on projecting an um, uh, H1 solution on an H diff space or using H diff spaces on H1 spaces. And I noticed you haven't mentioned any results about that. Uh, could you say a few words? What, what's your impression of this, those methods that do those projections? That would be for which problem, Elliptic my problem. first question. Um, Elliptic problems? What, what Elliptic possible? problem? Yeah. So in some sense, you were considering a mixed problem? Uh, yes. Isn't it, it, isn't, it, isn't it similar to have a uh, error in the constitutive uh, relation? Uh, no, no. It, it uses the Prager-Singer theorem. Yes. Uh, where you exactly, exactly. Yeah. So I, so I think this this kind of thing, uh, error estimate, this, does not apply to your problems. Is that what it is? I, I think it comes back to uh, the problems in which you try to consider this equilibrated error estimates. Mm -hmm. yes. When you have some equilibration, when you develop some uh, problems, local problems, and you try to uh, have to enforce uh, the equilibration at the boundary of those elements. Mm -hmm. Yes. This is, I think this is similar. In some ways, it's also similar to the, what, what, what people call the error in the con constitutive equation. Okay. So, so I looked at those. Uh, yes, those differences are very slim, very, not, not very important, but we can find the connections between those different approaches. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Serge, I think our time is up. And so as the big boss, which is Alvaro, uh, asked me to strictly enforce the timing constraints. Yes. 
Uh, I'm going to thank you very much for your very nice talk. And uh, thank I'm going to pass the word again to Albert. Thank you very much to all. And enjoy the meeting. <laughs>